Um, a serious social problem, uh, namely extreme selfishness, and how neuroscience might hold the answers to understanding it and to reducing it. Um, EPS is what we call this construct because it's otherwise a mouthful if you say excessive pathological selfishness. But we, we say EPS rather than just selfishness because, as Garman is fond of saying, everyone is selfish in the sense of prioritizing your own needs for survival over those of other people. Um, the problem comes when selfishness is extreme and when one's own needs are well satisfied, but um, one still continues to appropriate uh, resources needed by others. Oddly enough, we are all pretty opposite so nice. Um, we're all familiar with this phenomenon of extreme selfishness and how corrosive an effect it has on society. It's widely discussed. It's even the subject of numerous cartoons. But it has never been studied neurobiologically, which is a little strange in this era of cognitive neuroscience. Some years ago, Garamond, uh, Ted, and Joe, and Adrian and I sat together with coffee and donuts um, and discussed what we would need to do in order to study EPS uh, neurobiologically. Garamond then challenged us to carry out this research and generously supported it. Today, you will hear about the progress that has been made. So now let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Kodadad and about our two Penn faculty speakers. Garamond Kodadad came to the US from Iran and did his neurosurgery residency at Penn. He then um, went for further studies at the University of Toronto and did research there, returned briefly to Penn, and then joined the faculty of the University of Cincinnati Medical School, where he pioneered vascular surgery techniques that have helped to save countless lives and, um, and save brain function in those lives. Garman is now a professor emeritus of neurosurgery at Cincinnati, and with his sons, he has set up a family foundation dedicated to improving human life by better understanding the biological roots of excessive pathological selfishness. Garamond is here today, along with his son, Victor. Here's Victor. Here's Garamond. Um, and we thank them both for the support and the vision and the encouragement that they've given us over the years. And with that, we'll turn to our speakers. Ted Rodkin is a psychiatry professor here at Penn. He received his bachelor's and MD from Harvard, went on to further studies at Yale, and then Princeton University. Harvard, Yale, Princeton. You are slumming here at Penn. <laughs> okay, Ted's research spans basic translational and clinical studies of social behavior. His research exploits the complementary strengths of animal models and patient studies to link genes to brains to complex social behaviors. He's also co-director of the Autism Spectrum Program of Excellence here at Penn and director of the Adult Autism Spectrum Program also here at Penn. And we'll hear from you first. Followed by Joe Cable, who is a psychology professor as well with expertise focused in neuroeconomics and decision neuroscience, but extending into clinical psychology, addiction. Um, he's done some important work on education and brain training, which turns out to not be education, but it's very profitable for the companies that sell it. Um, and uh, he started out as a chemistry major at Emory, um, came here to Penn for his doctorate in cognitive neuroscience with Anton Chatterjee, who you, if you were here at last month's talk, you heard him speak. 
and then went on to, to NYU for further study in neuroeconomics, NYU being one of the meccas of uh, neuroeconomics. He's recently served as the president of the Society for Neuroeconomics and is currently the director of MindCore, which is Penn's hub for mind brain sciences. So we're going to begin with just a very little bit of conversation with our two speakers um, to set the context for these studies of the neurobiology of EPS and then um, into two longer uh, statements um, by each of them about their current research. So, my first question is, how do you differentiate EPS from what you might think of as normal selfishness, you know, being self-interested, self self-advocating, um, from aggression, from, what are some other things that it might be confused with? Um, no. Sociopathy. Yeah. Um, what do you think as a clinician? Well, I think that I think that um, Dr. Kodinat, or if I may call you Garman, um, <laughs> is the one who really uh, brought the, these distinctions to the fore for us and, and, and discussed them with us. And the idea that, as you said, Martha, that there is norm, what might be called quote unquote normal, or I think Adrian and your paper called it adaptive selfishness. So, a certain degree of self advocacy of meeting your own needs that's normal and necessary. And without it, you couldn't survive, you couldn't reproduce, and, and so on. Um, but, you know, then there's a level of selfishness that can become excessive in which um, one individual or a small group of individuals monopolizes resources way beyond what they need for what I mentioned before, like survival, reproduction, and so on, to the detriment of others around them. And then it sort of becomes dysfunctional or maladaptive um, in terms of the group functioning. So that, that's one way I think of distinguishing that. I mean, aggression, as you'll see from my uh, work on mice, aggression can be part of that, part of an EPS picture, I think, where um, part of the behaviors involved in monopolizing resources might involve aggressive behaviors, but aggression in and of itself is not the same thing as EPS. I mean, there's many different types and forms of aggression, and I don't think it's synonymous with EPS. Um, and maybe I'll let Joe respond. Yeah, thank you. And Joe, I mean, uh, if you want to add to that or just say, you know, what work in this area you're aware of, or if this is totally Terra and Nadia. Yeah, so, so the, uh, I mean, I think there's a, a lot of work that um, has been done that, that will eventually be able to relate back to this construct, but it hasn't been done um, uh, uh, in a manner that was aware of or aimed at this construct. And, um, you know, to, to just to like an example that Ted brought up of sociopathy or, or psychopathy and a related example that I think um, uh, people might think of is uh, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, uh, one of the things that we found in our research is that, you know, there is a relationship between those constructs and excessive pathological selfishness, but they don't. It's not a it's not a one to one identity relationship. It's a relationship where some components of those constructs do contribute to excessive degrees of selfishness, but there are other components of those, and those are kind of multi dimensional clinical constructs with three or four you know cardinal um, symptoms. You know there are other there are three you know three or three out of the four symptoms will have nothing to do with sort of excessive degrees of selfishness. So so I think you know there's a lot of work out there that will be able to relate to, to this construct uh, you know, once it get, uh, 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 once it's sort of better defined and understand, uh, understood, but has not been on point. Thank you. So basically, you all, you are getting um, you know, sort of a ringside seat for the early, early days 
of a new research venture. Um, this is, you know, as you can see, we still need to stop and think what exactly do we mean? What, are, what is it that we're studying? Um, Adrian Rain, um, whose work will come up a little later in these presentations, um, did a lot of uh, foundational work just trying to sort out what it, what it means psychometrically um, in relation to other kinds of psychological traits to be excessively pathologically selfish. So this is a kind of a nice, you know, however interested you are in EPS per se, and this is a very interesting topic. Um, I think you can also find interest in this work as, as an example of a nascent scientific endeavor. Um, it's kind of early days, and that makes it hard, but that makes it fun. So with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to Ted, who will talk about some of his work with mice and even a little with people. So, you know, the title of this overall presentation was um, I think Excessive and Pathological Selfishness from Mouse to Man. So this is the mouse part, okay? And the reason, um, I'll say in a minute why we're studying mice, um, but, you know, when Garriman came to us with this idea of studying EPS, um, one of his priorities was to develop an animal model um, through which we could study EPS. And... Um, well, I'll say in a minute why that's important, but, but we definitely wanted to, um, to meet that priority. So just to reiterate, so again, we've said this already, normal, quote unquote, normal or adaptive selfishness is that degree of selfishness that's required for survival and reproduction and so on. And uh, excessive and pathological selfishness, or EPS, could be defined as behaviors that result in obtaining much more than whatever is necessary for satisfying survival, reproduction, and betterment. Um, and having no regard for the needs of others, or monopolizing a resource beyond what is necessary for survival or reproduction to the detriment of others. So why study this in mice? Um, and why was Garriman interested in doing this in, a, in developing an animal model? The main reason is that um, animal models or mice provide experimental control over genetics and environmental factors and um, allow you to do experiments in a way that's not ethically uh, you know, would not be ethically good in humans. Um, <clears throat> and any kind of behavior like this, like EPS, is going to be very, very complicated. It's going to have a complicated biology with multiple neural circuits, etc. So the ability to dissect out genetics and environment is really useful. Um, also, the mouse is the leading model, experimental model organism for mammalian genetics. And there are many, many mouse strains, which we'll talk about, that genetically differ from each other that can be used to look at this. So our hypotheses were, I mean, our task really was to develop an assay. Like, no one has studied EPS in any animal that I know of. And when we set out to do this, we, um, we really scoured the literature. I scoured the literature personally. I consulted with several experts around the country who do all kinds of rodent work. And I said, have you ever heard of a of an assay of EPS, and they're like, I never heard of it. I never thought about it. And so there really was nothing. So, so, so the first step number one in studying this in animals is to be able to measure it and have some sort of a reasonably valid way of, of measuring it. And so that was our first task. And the second task was to test a couple of hypotheses. Um, one was um, that EPS, or the tendency to monopolize what I call a luxury item, in other words, some resource that's beyond what's needed for survival and reproduction. So, so that EPS would be affected by, number one, genetics, or um, in other words, strain differences, genetic strain differences would influence EPS, and also by prior experience or prior level of access to some luxury item. So basically what we were gonna look at was um, access to a toy uh, called a running wheel, and mice love running wheels. I mean, you have to imagine, these are mice in cages all day, they don't have much to do. So running on a running wheel is like great fun, it's like going to an amusement park for them. And uh, what we were looking at is the tendency of a mouse to monopolize access to this toy relative to another mouse. Um, and so the way we set this up was uh, we, we were looking at two different strains, genetically different strains. One is called C57 black 6 or B6, the other is called BALF-C. So that would help us look at the effect of the genetics. 
Um, and then what we did was we took two males of, of a particular strain. So we took two C57 black six males, which are genetically identical to each other. So they're kind of like housing two twins together. And um, we arbitrarily, randomly uh, designated one of these two identical mice as mouse number one, and the other would be mouse number two. And mouse number one, over the next three days, mouse number one got quite a bit more access to this toy than mouse number two. So each of the mice would individually go into a cage with a running wheel, and mouse number one would get an hour to play on the running wheel as much as it wanted. Mouse number two would only get 30 minutes to play. And this happened over three consecutive days. Each day, mouse number one would get a lot more time on the running wheel than mouse number two. Um, and then on the fourth day, um, we had a 15 minute test in which those two mice, mouse number one and number two, were put together in the cage with the running wheel. And we observed them for, be for behaviors like how much time did each mouse spend on the running wheel. I should say, really only one mouse at a time can comfortably fit on this running wheel. And if the other jumps on, it sort of becomes a matter of like one's going to stay on and one's going to get off. Um, so we observed them for how much time they spent on the running wheel. And um, we also observed them for aggression that seemed to be associated with wanting to monopolize the running wheel. So aggressive attack bites or aggressive grooms. And again, our hypothesis was that um, there would be effect of both genetics. So there would be an effect of strain and there would be an effect of prior experience. In other words, if you were mouse number one or mouse number two. And keep in mind, just to emphasize, mouse number one and two, th these were two mice of the same strain. So it was like a pair of B6 mice, genetically identical, but one had a different experience from the other. I think that was pretty good for not having anything on that slide, if I do say so. Okay, so um, what we found, just to get to the bottom line, is that um, one of our hypotheses was confirmed and one was not. Um, the one that was confirmed is that prior experience, so in other words, being mouse number one, the mouse that had a lot of access to this luxury item, um, versus mouse number two, so prior experience significantly affect monopolization of time on the toy. So what this graph shows on the left here is the valve C strain. This is data on one of the strains. This is mouse number, these are those valves that were mouse number one, and these valves that were mouse number two is an orange. And here's a separate strain, C57 black six. The blue bar is those C57 black sixes that were mouse number one, and here's uh, the orange mouse number two. So you can see pretty clearly that the blue bars or those you know, that were mouse number one were spending more time on the toy than mouse number two. However, there was not a significant effect of strain here. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, we broke this down by each of the strains. So this was a 15 minute test. So this is broken down by the first five minutes, second five minutes, third five minutes. And you can see for C57 black six, consistently throughout the test, the mouse number one, which had had more prior time on the toy, was spending more time on the toy during the test. And same thing, maybe not quite as striking, but the same thing for uh, the valve C mice. Um, <clears throat> Then we also looked at aggression, and um, this was um, attack, so we looked at two types of aggressive behaviors. One was attack bite behavior, which is essentially the most intense form of aggression, when one mouse will bite another. And I didn't mention before, but um, when a full-blown attack occurred, we would stop the test. So rather than going the full 15 minutes, if one mouse really started attacking the other, we would stop it to be humane. Um, but then there were also lower level aggressive behaviors that we call aggressive grooms, which were more like pushing, shoving, little nips, not a full blown attack. So this is data on a full attack bite. And this is the numbers of mice, the numbers of tests that were stopped due to an attack bite. And you, there's a sort of suggestion when you eyeball it that the mouse number one was biting more than mouse number two, although this didn't come out statistically significant. However, when you look at these lower level aggressive behaviors like the pushes and shoves and nips, the aggressive grooms, we found, we found the same finding that prior experience significantly affected aggressive behaviors near the toy. In other words, again, mouse number one that had had more time with the toy was being more aggressive than mouse number two. And this is for the C57 black six strain, and you also see this for the valve C strain. Um, and one other thing I just wanted to quickly point out about this um, is that, you know, one of our 
um, maybe concerns or hypotheses going into the, this is that um, there would be a big genotype effect on aggression because we knew a pre before starting this study, we knew from prior studies and our own experience that BALPC mice are very aggressive and C57 black six mice somewhat less aggressive. So we thought we'd see a big genotype effect on aggression. But actually in this context, we, we weren't seeing a significant genotype effect on aggression overall. We were mostly seeing the effect of the prior experience. So that was really interesting. Um, <clears throat> so this is a video, and I'm hoping this works. This, this is just a little example of uh, what it looked like. Okay, so mouse number one, spending a lot of time in the wheel. Now mouse number two tries to get on. He gets on a little. It's a little uncomfortable for them to both be on. Okay. So now mouse number two makes a, a break for it and gets on the toy. <laughs> now mouse number one. Is sort of grooming mouse number two, pushes mouse number two off, or trying to, pursues mouse number two, and then a fight breaks out. So, I mean, that's essentially sort of an example of, um, and, and we stopped the test after that. I know I see some grimaces, and we didn't let any mouse, no mouse ever really got injured. There was no blood drawn or anything like that. And if a serious attack like that happened, then we stopped the test. But that just sort of gives you a visual um, of what it looked like. And then I'm going to wrap up soon so that Joe can talk, but I also want to mention that we've also initiated a human um, part of, of this part of the EPS study. Um, we're carrying out a large genetic study. Um, it was mentioned before the Autism Spectrum Program of Excellence. And for this, and we've got some great lab members here who work on that. And for this study, we, we're recruiting hundreds of people um, pro bands as well as extended family members um, for this study. And we've added on a selfishness questionnaire that was developed by Adrian Rain and, and Stephanie Etta. Um, and so, so far we've enrolled 425 participants and we're going strong. I mean, I'm sure we're gonna get into the 600s if not more. And, and all of these participants are taking Adrian's selfishness questionnaire and we're collecting DNA from all the participants and doing whole genome sequencing in all of them. So this is a really great opportunity to understand something about the um, heritability of, uh, you know, of EPS and even genes that are involved. Now I'll just add one last thing, which is you might say to me, well, why would you, why would you want to study the genetics of this? I mean, I thought you just said, based on your mouse data, that there wasn't a significant effect of genetics. There was a significant effect of prior experience, but there was no significant effect of strain. And I would just, to interpret the mouse data, I would say, we looked at two different inbred mouse strains that differ in some ways genetically, but also share some genes. So it looks like in those two particular strains we looked at, there wasn't a significant effect of, the, of their specific genetic differences on this trait, but that doesn't rule out the possibility that there is a significant genetic effect based on other genes, if that makes any sense. I mean, we can talk more about that later. Um, so future directions would be to study, you know, what I really presented was the development of an assay and some initial data and some demonstration of the effect of prior experience on this behavior, but we haven't really gotten into the neural mechanisms by which prior experience might affect EPS in the mouse, and I think that would be a really, really interesting future direction, because a big question is, so what would it be about having lots of you know access to a luxury resource that would then later make you or make a mouse more likely to show EPS you know what kind of neuroplasticity or whatever is happening in neural circuits that might be associated with that so that would be a really interesting future direction and then we're going to continue to study genetic influences like I mentioned on humans and additional mouse models and a thank you um, uh, a big thank you to Garman Kodadad for, for the idea and the inspiration and for funding this, uh, to Martha for directing this, for Adrian for his work and the Selfishness Questionnaire, Joe, who you'll hear from a sec in a second, Kristen, uh, Joe's fantastic postdoc who's been working on this, Holly, who was the main person in my lab who um, worked on this and, and really you know spearheaded some of the ideas about the toy assay. Some other students in my lab, Mahid, Sammy, Michelle, Stephanie Ha, who worked with Adrian, and Warren Bilker, who helped with some of the statistical analysis. So I'm going to let Joe take over.
So uh, I'm going to follow on on tech here and tell you uh, a little bit about the work we've doing, been doing trying to uh, focus in on neural circuits that might underlie um, uh, excessive and pathological selfishness. And the starting point for the studies we've been doing has been a hypothesis about two potential abilities that are um, that might be uh, 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 related to excessive selfishness, uh, namely our uh, uh, abilities for emotional and for cognitive empathy. So, what I mean by um, what do I mean by emotional cognitive empathy? What I mean by uh, um, emotional empathy is um, our ability to generate um, an affective state in ourselves uh, uh, in response that mirrors uh, an affective state that we see in someone else. So we see someone else in distress, uh, that makes us feel distressed, uh, and we know that we're feeling distressed because that person also feels distressed. What I mean by cognitive empathy, uh, it's also has been called mentalizing or theory of mind, um, is a more abstract ability to infer unobserved mental states uh, in other people. What do they desire? What are they? What are their goals? What are their intentions? What is the, what is their knowledge? What is their beliefs? And to use that um, those inferences in order to make predictions uh, about their behavior. And. At the outset, we had the hypothesis that excessive selfishness could, in principle, come from uh, a reductions in either of these abilities, either, either reductions in emotional empathy or cognitive empathy or both. And that hypothesis has motivated a, a number of the studies that, we'll, that I'll tell you about. Um, and uh, it's important to note from the outset that part of the reason that we distinguish between these abilities is that they're linked to dissociable uh, neural networks. Um, so uh, what's shown in uh, red here are neural networks associated with emotional empathy. Um, these are all uh, sagittal slices through the brain. So this is the front, the back, the top, and the bottom. And the slices go from the right uh, hand side of the brain all the way to the left hand side. And in particular, uh, a core node in the network that's important for emotional empathy is the anterior insula, shown here on the right and the left. And another core node is the anterior cingulate, shown here at the midline. Um, and those are distinct from the core nodes that are important for cognitive empathy, um, uh, most notably the temporal parietal junction, shown here uh, on the right. Um, but also at the midline, the posterior cingulate cortex here and the dorsal medial frontal cortex here. And the fact that those um, <clears throat> uh, two abilities are linked to two different neural networks has allowed us um, uh, uh, to uh, dissociate them and to, um, uh, with, um, in our neural studies and to test independently the role in selfishness. So I first wanted to tell you a bit about how it, was, how it is that we're eliciting um, pictures like this of distinct uh, networks for emotional and cognitive empathy. And the task that um, we're, we're doing this um, using functional brain imaging, and the task that we're asking people to do during functional brain imaging is to listen um, to uh, movies of actors uh, performing, um, reading a little script for about 15 seconds each. Um, and some of these scripts are relatively unemotional and, and factual. Uh, like this one. Well, that was maybe five or six years ago. I visited the USA for the first time. I spent about two weeks of my holidays in San Francisco. Three months later, I moved there, and now I'm a teacher, math, German, and Spanish. Well, other the videos that we ask people to add, um, uh, listen to uh, involve more emotional content, um, like this one. Last year my mother died. I wasn't there because I live in America. All my father ever says to me is, we don't mean anything to you anymore. And I think at the moment, he's in a pretty bad place. The outline of the task is that people first get uh, the name of the person who they're gonna watch, and then they see that video. And as I said, some of the videos are neutral, and some of them are emotional. And the way that we elicit uh, activation related to emotional empathy is by comparing activity for while they're watching the videos, for those emotional videos, 
compared to those neutral values. And the emotions here are all negative emotions that should el uh, elicit some distress in the viewer. We then ask them a couple of questions about the video. How do you feel? How much compassion do you feel for the actor? Um, uh, but then in order to in, uh, elicit activation in cognitive empathy networks, we also ask them a question about the video. And here we're going to compare two different kinds of questions in order to identify these cognitive empathy networks. One question is a question about what the, uh, what the person in the video thinks or feels or believes. So it might be, with respect to that second video, what does the person think that their father thinks about them. Um, those are theory of mind or mentalizing or cognitive empathy questions, and we compare those to a baseline of a factual question. So it might be a question about the first video, what, what subject does the person um, teach? And by comparing emotional to a non, uh, to neutral videos, we hope to um, elicit activation in those emo emotional empathy networks, and by comparing these uh, kind of empathy or theory of mind questions to factual reasoning questions, we hope to um, uh, elicit uh, activation in cognitive empathy networks. Then conclude with a confidence question about your, uh, how confident you are um, in, the, in, the, uh, in your answer to the question we just asked. And this is pilot data. Uh, so this, uh, the fMRI study is ongoing. Um, uh, but the key question here, because we're interested in individual differences is, can we get these activations at the level of individual subjects? And um, we're uh, able to show at this point um, that we are. So these are data from single subjects. Um, and nonetheless, at the single subject level, that comparison of emotional to neutral videos elicits um, strong activation bilaterally in the anterior insula. While that comparison of the theory of mind questions to the factual questions elicits um, strong and selective activation in the um, nodes of the cognitive empathy networks, namely the um, temporal parietal junction um, on the right and the left, as well as the posterior cingulate cortex. So how, I've talked about these constructs and we want to relate them to uh, selfishness. How are we measuring um, selfishness in humans? Um, we talked a lot, Ted and I, about trying to get assays that are um, similar to each other at, a, at an abstract level, and so we wanted the assay to be about uh, um, uh, uh, an allocation of a resource. <laughs> um, and here we're uh, adapting a, a decision paradigm that's uh, been um, wide, uh, relatively widely used in the decision-making literature, but hasn't necessarily been tuned um, to look at individual differences. Uh, and uh, this paradigm in, uh, asks subjects to decide how to divide an endowment um, uh, between them and another person. I'll talk a little bit more about who that other person is, but at the baseline, that other person is just a uh, nameless, faceless uh, other person. Um, and so you're asked to divide, for example, an endowment of tokens, where those tokens are each worth points that are exchangeable for money. Um, so you might be asked, to divide 90 tokens between yourself, so holding the tokens, uh, where they're worth one point to you each, uh, versus uh, giving some of those tokens, passing some of those tokens to the other person. Again, where they're worth um, one, uh, one, uh, one point to the other person. And the thing that we manipulate in the, in the uh, paradigm is how much the tokens are worth to you versus the other person. So on some, uh, 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 Choices. It might be that they're each worth one, one point, um, but there are other choices where the tokens might be worth more to you than to the other person. In that case, it might reasonably, uh, it might be more, it might be reasonable for you to keep more of the tokens for yourself than to give them to someone else. Um, whereas on other trials, uh, the tokens uh, may be might worth much, much more to the other person than they are to yourself. And this is a, a, a situation where keeping all of the tokens to yourself even when they're were worth more money to the other person, we might uh, consider calling excessively selfish uh, behavior. And the metric that we use uh, um, uh, of selfishness in this task is the amount of advantageous iniquity that you create. The, um, the, how much more money do you keep for yourself compared to um, give to the other person across trials in this task? So how much more are you taking it all for yourself 
versus um, how much more are you keeping for yourself relative to the other person. Um, and I can say at the outset that uh, uh, the amount of iniquity that people create in this task, we've now um, run exactly this version in hundreds of people. Um, and uh, the selfishness questionnaire that uh, um, Adrian created is uh, strongly correlated with the amount of iniquity that people um, uh, uh, create in this task. And in particular, um, the, uh, the subscale on pathological selfishness is, is uh, uh, correlated with the amount of iniquity. Uh, one of the first studies that we did, though, because of our interest, uh, or one of the other things that we looked at in, these, uh, in this large group of subjects that we've had um, uh, uh, do this task, uh, is the relationship between uh, choices on this task um, and self-report measures of those two constructs that we were interested in, um, emotional and cognitive empathy. So we could ask people self-report questionnaires that would index, get at, their degree of emotional empathy. In particular, we used a, a, a measure called the um, affective and cognitive measure of empathy, um, which gives a, a, a readout of emotional empathy. And that same questionnaire also gives us a, a, a readout a subscale on cognitive empathy. And we can look at the relationship between these two um, and inequity um, in our decision tasks. And just to remind you, we had started out with the hypothesis that maybe one or the other uh, would be negatively correlated with inequity. That the more you had of these empathic abilities, the less inequity that you would create in the task. Um, and we confirm that hypothesis for emotional empathy. So we find that uh, higher degrees of emotional empathy are associated with look, creating less inequity in the decision task, more fair allocation from the decision task. Um, but somewhat surprisingly, what we found is Controlling for the levels of emotional empathy, we see that cognitive empathy is positively correlated with creating um, inequity in this decision task. So controlling for your level of emotional empathy in the same regression, having uh, better abilities to read the, what other people know and what their goals are is positively correlated um, with creating inequity in this task. Um, now, that was uh, somewhat surprising to us. I should say um, that the first result is incredibly reliable. We see it across that, that emotional empathy is negatively correlated with inequity, does not depend on the particular measure of emotional empathy that we use. We've replicated it across several samples now. Um, the second result is a little more fragile um, in that um, it does depend on the particular measure that you use. Um, but we never see our initial prediction, which is uh, a negative relationship between cognitive empathy and inequity, um, controlling um, for emotional empathy. Um, uh, we all, always see either no relationship or, or this positive relationship. So we do have some uh, hints as to what uh, the potential role that the cognitive empathy networks might be playing in these kinds of decisions from another study that we've completed, which uses transcranial magnetic stimulation to inhibit the temporal parietal junction, which is one of these um, nodes in the cognitive empathy network. Now, transcranial magnetic stimulation is we, we run, it, there's basically, we run electricity through a coil that creates a magnetic field. That magnetic field then disrupts the neural tissue underneath the coil. Um, and we can direct the coil using uh, we can take a, use MRI to take an image of the subject's brain um, and then direct the coil to a particular area of that subject's brain. And in this case, we're going to direct the coil at a spot in the temporal parietal junction, which is one of the key nodes in that um, cognitive empathy network. And in this study, um, we have two TMS conditions. So we're either going to uh, direct and we're running the coil in a way that we think inhibits the underlying neural tissue. Um, we're using a, 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 a kind of stimulation called continuous theta burst uh, stimulation that we think inhibits the underlying tissue. So uh, we have two uh, TMS conditions in, in this study, one in uh, which we're directing that inhibition at the temporal parietal junction, and another in which we're directing it um, uh, to an area where we think it doesn't reach any underlying neural tissue. So this is a control that has all of the same um, 
uh, setup and uh, TMS noises and everything else, uh, but doesn't have any functional effect on the underlying brain. And then we're looking at decisions with respect to two different kinds of other players. Uh, our subject is playing, um, uh, is making decisions in one case with respect to what I call the sort of baseline of the task. This is just a minimally identified future participant. We say there'll be a future participant, you're dividing the money between you and the other person. Um, and another um, uh, condition where you're dividing the money between yourself and someone who is participating in the study at the same time that you are. You meet them, uh, you see that they're a real person, they sit next to you while you're filling out, um, uh, while you're making your decisions. And you know that your decisions will affect them and they know that your decisions will affect them. And what we find is that inhibition of the temporal parietal junction eliminates a context-dependent um, uh, 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 form of selfishness. So if we just look at the control condition, and again, look at that measure of inequity, our, our measure of selfishness, uh, what we see is that people are uh, generate more inequity, they're more selfish with respect to the minimally identified, nameless, faceless other person. Um, compared to the person who they've met and who's physically present and who's sitting right next to them. But when we inhibit the temporal parietal junction, what we see is that that eliminates um, that difference between those two uh, uh, conditions. Um, and so, you know, one potential interpretation of these results is that um, under this condition, it requires some reasoning about the other person, what the other person may know, and what the other person may believe, um, and what they can know, in order to justify to yourself keeping a little bit more um, uh, for when you're uh, making the decision about the minimally identified other relative to the person who's physically present. So, again, I think that that result was uh, surprising to us based on our initial <coughs> hypothesis, but made a more sense in light of the self-report results that suggest that under some conditions, cognitive empathy can contribute to selfishness rather than um, uh, uh, be, uh, uh, re uh, rather than be something that's um, protective against uh, selfishness. So, in ongoing work, one of the things that we're interested in is, is, is I said that, that the fMRI study is ongoing, is linking activations in that fMRI study to individual differences um, in behavior in that decision task. And in particular, the hypothesis um, that we want to test is that the strength of activation in the emotional empathy networks, particularly the anterior insula shown here, um, uh, when people are watching those emotional compared to neutral videos, will be positive, will be negatively associated with the degree of inequity, the uh, degree of selfishness um, uh, that they exhibit on the decision task, um, and that that will be um, uh, uh, that will affect overall levels, right? Not just context-dependent um, levels, depending on who you're playing with. Um, if that if we get that result, um, uh, which is a result that would um, uh, be consistent with the self-report um, relationship between affective empathy and inequity or selfishness, um, we're then uh, set up nicely to follow up on that result uh, with a TMS study um, that would then we'd then be able to um, further test the causal role of that network in selfishness by inhibiting it with TMS. Um, uh, with the hypothesis that inhibiting a node of the affective empathy network, such as the anterior insula, um, would lead to enhanced iniquity and enhanced degrees of selfishness on the decision path. Um, and we can talk of even more uh, if this works out in the future. Um, I think this is a network, it's certainly an ability, um, as opposed to cognitive empathy, which uh, there's evidence seems to be um, pretty unique to humans. Affective empathy is something that's shared across animals. Um, and so uh, I think if that ends up being the core network, there's a, a number of interesting parallel experiments um, that, that have nothing to do in the future to examine. Um, I also want to um, uh, uh, thank everyone who was involved in this, um, uh, uh, Garman um, and his family, uh, for quite generously supporting the work. Um, I think. Uh, it has enabled us to get what may be the first um, NIH grant related to uh, excessive selfishness, which is a postdoctoral grant to support um, Kristen. Um, 
Kristen, I should say, uh, did all of the studies that I just presented, um, like all of them. And uh, in, in fairness, really should be here giving this talk. But the only reason she's not is that she's um, at home with her uh, brand new baby boy. Um, otherwise, she'd be up here uh, rather than me. Um, uh, uh, so this is all Kristen's work. Desmond um, helped out, uh, was our collaborator on the TMS study. Um, uh, Ted and Martha and Adrian um, have been uh, wonderful collaborators in conceptualizing all of this work. Um, these are folks, uh, many graduate students and um, uh, RAs in my lab who participated in, in the different studies that we've done, as well as some collaborators um, in Australia who did, designed the uh, 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 emotional videos, hence the Australian accents. <laughs> <laughs> okay.